Here we are outside presenting the podcast today. I thought it would be a break from the norm that would be pleasant for you and pleasant for us. Of course, you may hear birds in the background and you might hear the sound of flowing breeze because we've got a nice breeze today. And every now and then you might even hear a plane go overhead because we're not far from the airport in our city. But it's a nice atmosphere to talk about how God is making you a priest. I know you're probably not used to thinking of yourself underneath that heading, but that's very much a part of what the new covenant is all about. In 1 Peter 2, 5, God calls you a holy priesthood. In 1 Peter 2, 9, God calls you a member of the royal priesthood. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it talks about how he has washed us from our sins in his blood and made us kings and priests. But the most emphasized scripture on this particular podcast is going to be from Isaiah 61. And I've saved that for the very end. And it's going to be so powerful. Praise God for that. Now, I'm going to take you through successive stages of the revelation of what it took to become a priest in the Old Testament and compare that on a higher level of revelation concerning how God makes people priests in the New Covenant. It's all part of the image-making process, though, because, see, Jesus is referred to as the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But all of his offspring bear his priestly image. So every son and every daughter of God qualifies by virtue of our relationship and our born-again experience to have priesthood in our spiritual DNA is a part of who we are. So I want you to take all the old covenant symbolism and, and then apply it on a new covenant level to your life. To who you are in Christ. Now, here's three qualifications for priesthood out of the Old Testament. Number one, you had to be a Levite or one of the offspring of Levi. Levi was one of the 12 sons of Jacob and his offspring were chosen for the priesthood because they were more passionate than any other tribe about protecting the purity of Israel and upholding the commandments against idolatry and worshiping other false gods. But according to Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 20 through 22, it's very evident that the status of being a Levite passes to every born again believer in the new covenant. So what does that mean and what relevance does that have? The word Levi means joined. And the implication is you are joined to God in a special covenant of intimacy, worship, service of God, and as a Levite, representing him in this world. You are covenantally joined to God. So spiritually, you've inherited a Levitical status. Number two, the priests had to be the offspring of Aaron. Now, the Levites were given as a gift to Aaron to do the service of the tabernacle, but only the offspring of Aaron originally were able to function in the outer court at the altar of sacrifice in the holy place, ministering there uh, before God. And so that bears a symbol because the word Aaron means enlightened. And I believe Aaron the high priest, the brother of Moses, was a type and a shadow of the enlightened one to come, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the light of the world. He came with full understanding of how to come back into a relationship with God and shared that revelation knowledge with us, enlightening us. So because the name Aaron means enlightened, and to be a priest under the old covenant, you had to be a son of Aaron, therefore you have to be a son of the enlightened one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came fully understanding, fully comprehending the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And then he said to us, it is given to know those mysteries. Number three, 
you could not be a priest if you had any kind of physical deformity in your body or any kind of imperfection because the physical mirrored the spiritual. It was God's way of saying to be a priest. You can't have a hidden false agenda concerning your walk with God. You can't be hypocritical in uh, professing to the world that you're a believer and then living like an unbeliever behind the scenes. You can't have those kind of imperfections in your life. So what rituals were performed in order for the sons of Aaron to be qualified for priesthood? Because all of those rituals have a spiritual, symbolic, metaphorical, prophetic significance, and we can apply them to our lives. First of all, for seven days, the sons of Aaron had to go through various rituals and requirements in order to qualify for the priesthood. And seven is the number of perfection, fullness, and wholeness. And once again, that's a symbol that if we're going to be functioning priests, not priests in title, but priests in actuality in the New Testament era, there's got to be a certain passion to strive for excellence and wholeness and perfection in your life, not allowing compromise in any area. Then, this is what God says in Exodus 29, verse 1. And actually, I'm going to be referencing a lot of verses in Exodus 29. You should go back and read chapter 29 and chapter 30 of Exodus just to get the full information on what was required in order for the sons of Aaron to become priests. But starting with verse 1, it says, This is what you shall do to them to hollow them for ministering to me as priests. And the word hollow means to consecrate and make holy. To consecrate and make holy. He said, I am holy, so you are to be holy. That's heaven's requirement. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, and unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and make them of wheat flour, and you shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bull and the two rams. So that was the offering that had to be offered up, and they had to be done a certain way so that Aaron's sons could be recognized by heaven as being functional in their priesthood role. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details, but there's some really interesting parts. First of all, God commissioned Moses to do what was necessary for Aaron and his sons to qualify. So they had to have a mediator. And you and I have to have a mediator. We cannot just decide to qualify for priesthood. We have to have someone who does that for us. And of course, Moses also was a type of Christ who readies us for the priesthood, who qualifies us for the priesthood. I'll talk about the bull and the ram and also the unleavened bread in just a little bit. But first, I want to give you the second requirement, which was to be washed with water. He brought Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle, and they were washed. And they of course, in the wilderness, were washed with supernaturally created water because their source of water was the rock that followed them in the wilderness. And when Moses struck the rock, out gushed this river that was supernaturally created. And so they were being washed in water that came from God himself. How amazing is that? And the water represents two things because in John chapter 7, the Holy Spirit is symbolized by water. And in Ephesians chapter 5, the Word of God is symbolized as water. Two elements in water, just like H2O makes up natural water. The Word and the Spirit make up spiritual water. And so if you and I are going to be priests, number one requirement, you've got to be washed in the water of the Word and the water of the Spirit. Not just one time either. 
It's a daily exercise. It's a daily requirement. I didn't mention that there might be bugs out here too, <laughs> but uh, that's what happens when you go outside. All right. Then according to Exodus 29 verse four, they had to have a special or, or rather Exodus chapter 29 verses four through nine, they had to have special clothing. And I'm going to go over that clothing real quickly. Number one, they were to wear a white linen tunic. It had to be linen. It couldn't be made of some kind of cloth like cotton that causes sweat. Sweat is only mentioned three times in the Bible. And the first time is with the curse. When the curse was given in the beginning, God said that Adam and his offspring would labor for their bread by the sweat of their brow. That's Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. And then it's mentioned in Exodus 44, or Ezekiel 44, rather, verses 17 and 18. And that's where the priests were told to wear linen. And the reason for it was because they were not to clothe themselves with anything that caused sweat. Hmm. And then the third time sweat is mentioned in the Bible is Luke 22, 44, where Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and bloody sweat came out of his pores as he paid the price to loose us from the original curse. So sweat implies working by human effort to somehow achieve a place of purpose in this life and a place of connection with God. Human sweat won't do it. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he could not go in there with sweat because it represents human effort. The curse of this realm, being separated from God and having to struggle within yourself to get back to him, but you can't unless you have a mediator. So that was important. And also the garments they wore, the tunics they wore were white and white represents righteousness and purity. Then they also had a sash around them. And that sash was made of blue and purple and scarlet, the very same colored materials that the veil to the outer court, the veil to the holy place and the veil to the holy of holies were made of. And so they had a sash that tightened around their waist area that identified them with access into the presence of God. The blue represents heavenly things. The purple represents royal things. The scarlet represents redemptive things. And so they had to be tied about with this three colored sash that represented three aspects of what happens when you come into the presence of God, you become heavenly minded. You become part of his royal seed, his royal family that have the restoration of dominion in this world. And you have access to redemption through the blood that was shed for you. That's what the sash represented. Then they were to wear a bonnet on their heads that looked like a blossoming flower. I'm kind of glad that that's not required for priests in the new covenant. Um, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious, but I would feel a little silly wearing a bonnet everywhere I go. Spiritually, I don't mind. Naturally, not my preference. But the bonnet looked like a blossoming flower because flowers are beautiful. And God did mention in Exodus that the garments of the priests were for glory and for beauty for glory and for beauty. And so God's all about clothing you if you're going to be a priest. He clothes you with garments of praise. He clothes you with robes of righteousness. He clothes you with, uh, with zeal as a cloak. There's different kinds of spiritual garments that he's clothing you with for glory and for beauty. Praise God. But anyway, the headpiece also speaks of this because flowers emit a sweet aroma. They're wonderful to smell and then get out of here fly and <laughs> uh, what well, he smelled the flower scent and, and wanted to uh get some of the uh 
accent on him, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the that represents the fact that we should live worshipful lives that are a sweet aroma to God, where he smells a sweet savor of worshipfulness arising from us. Also, I think it's important to see that the priests were required to walk barefoot in the sanctuary area when they were in the tabernacle of Moses and later on in the temple of God. That was the requirement. So it kept them grounded. And I'm not talking about grounding where you walk on the grass so that you can pick up the energy of the earth. That's kind of a new agey idea, I think. But uh, it's talking about being grounded in the constant reminder that you don't hide yourself from your own flesh, like it says in Isaiah 58. You recognize, yes, I've been chosen by God to be a priest, but I'm still of the seed of Adam. I have internal strugglings. I need the grace of God. I need to stay grounded. So walking barefoot reminded them to be humble before the Lord. And it reminded them of their worthlessness without God's intervention. Now, we're going to be quoting in just a little bit Isaiah 61 that shows you the connection between reminding yourself of how empty and worthless and futile your life is without God, yet at the same time embracing the highness and the greatness of your calling. Praise God. So, wash with water and special clothing was worn. That's really significant. And then they were consecrated through the sacrifice of a bull and through the sacrifice of two rams. And there was a special application of blood that took place. So that's found in verses 10 through 19 of Exodus 29, where it talks about how the bull was sacrificed. I'm not going to go into that. Of course, it had to be without blemish because the bull and the rams represented Jesus who was without sin. And in the case of one of the rams, I believe it represented that we are to live lives without sin to the best of our ability. Exodus 29, verses 18 and 19, God said that they should burn one of the rams on the altar as a burnt offering unto God, which would be an offering of a sweet aroma. Now, a burnt offering that was consumed with fire and reduced to ashes always symbolized total, total consecration to God, consumed with the holy fire of God. But they were to take the other ram, which represented not the priest, but the Messiah. They were to take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands on the head of the ram, transfer of sin. See, laying on of hands always means a transfer. And they would transfer their sins to the head of the ram, and then the ram would be slain. A symbol of the Messiah, how our sin was transferred to him. Now listen to this closely. In Exodus 29, 20, he said, Then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the right ear of his sons and on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood all around the altar. And what did that mean? Of course, that ram represented the Savior and the blood he shed for us. But the blood being put on the right ear of the priest, to me, represents God awakening our spiritual hearing so that we can hear his voice. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I give unto them eternal life. So from that point forward, we should be guided by his voice, and we should have discernment through his voice awakened in our lives. What about the right thumb? Well, your hand is what you use to interact with other fellow human beings. So the right thumb being anointed with blood talks about the sanctification of your relationships, that all your relationships are based on godly attitudes of heart, that there is no ungodly ties that you have with other human beings, whether it be through dishonesty on your part or lust on your part or unforgiveness on your part, your relationships are clean. 
and then blood on your right big toe and I'm not going to pull my foot up to exemplify that and <laughs> that would look a little ridiculous but the blood on the right toe to me represents your walk through this world that you should walk in the truth and walk in the light and walk in love and the Bible commands all three of those things walking according to God's direction he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So a sanctified walk. All three of these were required or you couldn't be a priest. Those three areas had to be sanctified unto God. And then in verse 21 of Exodus 29, God said, take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil. See, he poured anointing oil on Aaron, but he took some of the anointing oil and sprinkled it on his sons and took the blood and sprinkled that blood on their garments. See, our garments have been washed in the blood of Jesus and we've been sprinkled with the anointing. Jesus is the one that's anointed with the oil of gladness above all the rest of us. The oil was poured on the high priest, Aaron, but it was sprinkled on his sons. Thank God for that special anointing oil designed in Exodus chapter 30 that was only to be used to consecrate people into the priesthood and other priestly functions. Then they were to take one loaf of bread, one cake made with oil, this is verse 23, one wafer from the basket of the unleavened bread that was before the Lord. So this was consecrated bread. And they were to put all of these in the hands of Aaron and the hands of his sons. And first they waved that bread as a wave offering before the Lord. Now, a wave offering was usually the breast of an animal or the shoulder of an animal that was waved before God, and it was a symbol of all your heart and all your strength being offered to God. But now they're offering bread, and all of it has to be unleavened. Leaven is a symbol of sin, false doctrine, religious hypocrisy, worldliness. There's many symbols attached to leaven that are all bad, except for one case in Scripture. And when God said to take the bread that was unleavened and wave it before the Lord, what is bread used for? To nourish the body. Why would you wave bread before God to say, God, I want my life to nourish your heart. Bread exists to be consumed by others for their betterment. And so for a priest to lift up these offerings of bread was a way of saying, I want to become living bread just like the Messiah was living bread without leaven in my life. And first and foremost of all, I nourish God with my worship. I nourish his heart with my adoration. Praise God. And there's a lot more in there that I won't go into. But then in verse 32, it says, Then Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. That's why I quit eating bologna years ago. I read the package and it said beef lips and hog snaps. And I immediately envisioned beef lips, cow lips with the cud running over and hog snaps. And I thought, pass the lettuce, please. <laughs> you are what you eat. And so if you eat the flesh of the ram, which represents Jesus, and you eat the bread, which represents Jesus in the role of the sacrifice and the living bread that he came to fill, then what you eat is what you become. It goes down into your body. Naturally speaking, is broken down by the various digestive juices and distributed to the rest of your body. So food loses its identity and becomes you. And priests need to lose their ego and lose their identity and become a manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ, bearing his image in this world. Praise God. All of this is powerful. And all of this is so that God can make you holy. Because in Leviticus 10.10, 10, God said the particular job given to the priests and the Levites was to make a distinction, to distinguish between what is holy and unholy, what is unclean and what is clean, so that they could become the conscience of the nation of Israel. See, they had no inheritance in Israel. 
God said, the Levites shall have no inheritance in Israel. They never inherited a land mass. There were 48 Levitical cities spread all around Israel because they were to be pockets of influence throughout all the tribal areas so that they would be reminded of the law. And see, God uses you who fulfill the priesthood calling to become the conscience of people who are oblivious to their conscience that you work around, that you live around, that you interact with. Now I'm going to read one last scripture and then I'm going to end. This is how God makes a priest. And possibly I'll do another podcast on this particular passage. Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 6 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. This is the passage Jesus used to announce his ministry. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now this is an extension beyond what Jesus quoted in the synagogue at Nazareth. To comfort those or console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So he takes broken people, messed up people, who are captivated by sin and brokenhearted because of life, and they're in prisons of depression or compromise or evil in their lives. He looses them. He gives them the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness to turn them into trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why? So that they can start the process of rebuilding this world. Because verse 4 says, They shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the ruined cities and the desolations of many generations. We're working against the curse. And then in verse 6, it says, You shall be named the priests of the Lord. So God takes brokenhearted people and heals them and liberates them from their captivity so that they have empathy for others that are in a similar kind of situation. And as a priest, not only do we minister to him, but we minister to them to bring them into the fold so that they can share this priesthood calling too. There's a lot more to it. Dig in the word of God and you'll find out.